Uh, any questions from any members on K-12 public schools? Uh, Representative Conrad. Thank you. The one item in the money report, <clears throat> excuse me, that I'm a little mystified about that perhaps I need a little more background and justification as why we're doing is number five, uh, the read to achieve item. Uh, a little mystified why uh, we're using non-recurring funds for a program that is operating on a, a yearly basis and also the, the reduction and is that somehow related to um, on the previous page the literary coaches or is that a disconnected item I mean are we trying to do move from doing the summer reading camps to focusing more and getting the job done during the school year or, or what is the I, I just need a little more information on this. Uh, thank you Representative Conrad. The chairs did have uh, lots of conversation about that and I'm going to let Representative Blackwell uh, address your question. Uh, thank you Mr. Chairman. Yes, they are connected. Uh, Ed, education strategy, a House Select Committee met uh, during the interim, and we had some presentations made to us that they felt like if we intensified the delivery of services through the use of these literacy coaches during the regular school year, that it would really do a lot to advance the ultimate goals of Read to Achieve to get more kids reading on grade level. So what we chose to do was to uh, anticipate that by spending the money while they're there in a regular school year to try to get a better result that there would be hopefully less need for after school during the summer work and not knowing how that's all going to play out we decided to make the funds for reading camps non-recurring we figured there still be children that will need those services and we didn't want to eliminate them all together but we'll take another look at it and also, we'll be looking very uh, closely at the uh, use of the literacy coaches to see if that extra money actually helps to improve the performance before they leave third grade to go on to fourth and fifth. Just one follow-up to that as well. That does not impact the, the, the uh, third grade reading camps at all, just as an FYI. Uh, Representative Elmore and then Representative Michelle. Uh, yes, my question was in the same vein. Um, I didn't have the opportunity to serve on your committee, uh, Chairman Blackwell, I'm sorry, but this, so I hope this question is not redundant. Uh, the literacy coaches were created under either um, Purdue or Easley. One, we've had this program before. Was there any studies at that time on the effectiveness of the literacy coaches because we've tried that program uh, in the past and it was um, eliminated. Chairman Blackwell. Uh, the name literacy coach is the same but the intent is that it's going to be a different program. Read to Achieve as you know is modeled to a large degree on a program that came from Florida and they had reading coaches or literacy coaches down there and what we have done, if you look in the special provision that relates to this, there are some pretty firm requirements both on what qualifications are required of someone to be a literacy coach, and there are also some pretty strong requirements on what they can actually what they are to actually do. So the hope is that the language in the special provision combined with the funding for these positions and the targeting to only those about 300 of the lowest, the, hopefully the 300 lowest performing schools will actually make an impact on the reading ability of those kids. Thank you. Brian. One thing that may be worth adding, just the, the antecedent literacy coach program, I believe focused in the middle grades so this this program that's proposed here by the chairs is elementary based. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Representative Michelle. Yeah, I've got a couple of little. I got a couple of questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, going to the money report on page F four. Uh, on the item number two, the non-instructional support personnel. Uh, that appears to be a change. 
I don't know how you, you term it, but you, you were taking that 40, that 57 million from lottery funds and putting it into where we, where we were getting the support personnel money from initially. Where were we getting it from initially in that, since you were making it the same? Mr. Chair, uh, thank you, Representative Michaud. Two years ago, non-instructional support was fully supported from net appropriations, or you know, sometimes called general fund. Last year, there was significant change in the in how lottery receipts were divvied out in the, in the budget. So, non-instructional support, essentially about 310 million of it, became funded out of lottery with a small remainder coming out of net appropriation. What this item does is put more lottery receipts in. No more appropriation to have the same total, the 372 million. So over two years, it's gone from fully general fund supported to fully lottery supported. I guess follow up. Yeah, follow up on that point. Did we ever get rid of the non-supplant clauses? In that? Your initial lottery act, sir, the one that passed, did, did not end up having a, an explicit supplant clause. But we certainly had a discussion about that. Okay. Um, Additional follow-up. Yes. Um, going to item four on the same page, the uh, elimination of the additional first grade teaching position. Could you give me a little bit more explanation on that one, Brian? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, so, so with this this item, you may recall that in last year's conference budget, uh, was not your initial house budget, but in the conference budget, money was provided in the second year of the biennium to reduce first grade uh, class size rate or essentially the classroom teacher ratio from one teacher per 17 students to one to 16. That hasn't actually gone into effect yet, but the money's in the budget to do that. What this item would do essentially is to pull that back, keep the ratio at one to 17, and not go ahead with the class size reduction in first grade. So, follow up. Follow up. Yeah. To be clear, the reduction in classroom size that we put in is now not going into effect. Is that, that's, is that what I'm Yes, saying? sir. The item four here would undo that. I have just a couple more, Mr. Chairman. Short ones. Representative Michelle. Uh, in the uh, uh, special provisions, we're going to page one on special provisions, funds for children with disabilities, and you can answer the same question on funds for academic and gifted children. <coughs> what, what, how much the child is uh, comes out of federal receipts for both of these. These are all, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Michelle, these are all state supported amounts. So there are additional IDA funds that flow separately through the budget for students with disabilities, so you're on point with that. Uh, but these amounts here, the nearly 4,000 per child from state sources for, uh, for the children with disabilities, as well as the 12, 1280 per child for academically gifted, those are all from state funds. And can you give me a total uh, with the IDA money? Uh, I can follow up with you later on that, sir. Yeah, but the brain's not much in that one. Chairman Blackwell. I just, I wanted, I wanted to uh, offer a comment in response to one of uh, Representative Michelle's questions or comments on the class size reduction number. Uh, one of the reasons, thinking for myself, and I think maybe for my co-chairs, uh, that we did that is, again, in our effort to try to provide more intense reading services through those literacy coaches, we had to find money somewhere else. And the hope was, or, and the thinking was, that the reading coach, the literacy coach, and the special uh, qualities that we hope they're going to bring to the process would do more than a first or second grade teacher having 16 kids instead of 17 in his or her classroom. So it, it is sort of a trade-off uh, in my mind that we're saying we're going to use that money, but we're going to use it in a somewhat different way, which will provide more instruction and more teaching. It just won't be in the form of a uh, classroom reduction time. Uh, additional questions? Uh, Representative Gill. I'm looking on page uh, F7. And I'm looking at the, uh, the, yeah, the grants. 
is this part of the whole grant pool of money? And these are specific grants that have been given priority? Uh, right. Re Re Representative Hill, so most of the money the state appropriates through the Department of Public Instruction either is for state board slash DPI employees or the majority of it really just flows out to your charter schools and LEAs. There are a few instances, however, where you've directed specific appropriations to non-state organizations. So Teach for America already gets an appropriation from the state budget, as well as communities and schools, as well as beginnings uh, for, for family or beginnings for parents. Um, these, these grants here, items 17 through 20, would be in addition to the three existing sort of what you might call directed grants that go to non-state organizations. So there's not per se a grant pool uh, by which organizations receive funds typically through the public schools budget. The at-risk program the last few years has had a reservation of I believe $5 million to do after-school programs and some non-state entities have participated in that. But by and large there is not a grant pool by which chairs are proposing to direct the certain folks. These are standalone appropriations and non recurring money to the four organizations. Follow up? So the monies that are allocated here will have to be pre-allocated each year? So, so right. that, that's correct, Representative Gill, that any, anything non-recurring in this budget, if, if it were to be enacted, the following year would not be included in the base budget. The General Assembly would have to reconsider. On the other hand, of course, the General Assembly always is reconsidering its appropriations every year, too. Both recurring and non-recurring. Additional questions from committee members before we move on to community colleges. Uh, Representative Lucas. Thank you, sir. Item 14 on page 3, the I don't know if you'd like to, to guess on that, Brian. <laughs> I'll be glad to have you. <laughs> I think that was from the governor's budget. Uh, Brian, I don't know if you have anything additional to add to that. I mean, certainly, Mr. Chair, over time, I mean, Representative Lucas, when I first started working with you on the budget, we had fuel prices tip it up to about $4 per gallon. So certainly we've seen fluctuations over time. You know, there is an estimate done every year through the Office of State Budget and Management projecting out diesel fuel costs for the state. My understanding is that this amount would be in keeping with that projection. That said, there's really some risk built into it. Follow up. Representative Blackwell, is that the comment? Quickly, uh, Representative Lucas, basically our understanding is that we're using the same process for trying to do the best job we can of predicting it, so we didn't feel like we had any basis, despite the uncertainty that you cite, for rejecting it, and we certainly don't have any substitute basis for suggesting what it might actually turn out to be if it were to be higher. So. Okay. Nothing has changed to our knowledge. We're just following a process that's been in place for the, I guess this is my eighth year in the legislature, and, and we're just taking this adjustment that they determined. Uh, I don't want to a short question. Well, last question, Representative Sean. Yeah, I, Brian, I just want to be clear that the amount of change in the public school budget is approximately 12 close to $13 million, is, 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 that, is that what I'm saying? That's not including salaries. And I'm, I'm not talking about I'm not yeah, I'm, 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 so, 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 right. so, Representative Michaud, then perhaps the chairs wish to expand on, on whatever observations I make. Net appropriation increase here, you're reading correctly, about $13 million. Requirements, which is sort of the what actually will go to programs because those lottery receipts go to the program, that's about $70 million in total. Of course, often you're talking about net appropriations and not trying to obscure that. And I think that's the point was made to the side or behind me that does not include any compensation that may or may not come. Yep. All right, with that, 
Uh, thank you, Brian. We will move on to community colleges and go through the uh, same process.